May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. So Mother's Day is actually a bit of a conundrum for priests and preachers. Um, it exemplifies the question, are we in the world or are we apart from it? It's like that thing after Thanksgiving where you're inundated with Christmas music everywhere in society except in church, where we will only sing Advent hymns until the 12 days of Christmas, when, because of the outside world, we are, in fact, over them and over the decorations in our house and ready to move on into January. It is not generally a church celebration, Mother's Day, but it is, as you see, a day when people come to church. And if I'm honest, I've been asked to pray over many things in my priest time. I bless dogs, once a tarantula. Uh, I didn't touch that one. That was homes, furniture, stuffed animals, and on the request of a very insistent three-year-old, pebbles. So it seems silly to refuse to pray for moms. But still, how much do we pray for moms when half of Mother's Day does seem like a pitch to spend money? Now, Mother's Day is, yes, a firmly secular holiday, but it actually has faith-filled roots. It was originally crafted and created out of the 1900s, the very early 1900s, from an idea from one woman, Anna Jarvis, who wanted to honor her mother after her passing. Now, if you think back to the early 1900s, motherhood was firmly entangled with also notions of womanhood, and a substantial amount of the mothering work was invisible, unappreciated, and frankly, just expected labor. So a day set aside to say thank you felt particularly fitting. Businesses, however, caught on very quickly uh, to the fact that you can actually make a lot of money off of making people feel guilty for not thanking people enough. And Miss Jarvis herself wanted to throw the entire holiday away by the end of her life. On top of the commercialization of gratitude, womanhood and motherhood in our time have rightfully become separate identities. And the nuance and complications that have actually always been a part of womanhood and motherhood about broken relationships, about wanting things maybe our bodies refuse to do for us, about loss and grief, which at one point in time held, was held only in the dark and shamed private corners of our hearts, have finally been brought to light. The idea, therefore, of thanking mothers and examining motherhood having layers has both joy and pain. Many of my clergy colleagues, therefore, as a result, would like to just toss it right out of church. Leave it to Hallmark, they post, and they argue that we move on. That's happening out there in the world, and here we just carry on. Easter season, week six, go eat brunch elsewhere. But see, the thing with that is that when faith chooses to leave a popular secular conversation, the secular world has this bad habit of not backing off, but instead leaning in and filling in the gaps. And if we're honest about the secular world, it is pretty terrible about nuance. Your pain, therefore, insults my joy. Your joy insults my pain. The what about me of the culture of sin and humanity is just not the place for us to leave Mother's Day. The secular world has taken the narrative of motherhood and transformed it into stereotypes, into an occupation, into a time to spend money, into a high time to heap criticism on those who aren't, into a time to take one moment and act like we can isolate it and honor it and then leave it to be for the rest of the year. Mother, the title, 
comes actually from an attribute and an ability, one that isn't actually gendered, and one that isn't childbirth only defined. Motherhood is actually a trait of God. If we roll all the way back, the very first chapter of Genesis. So God created humankind in God's image. In the image of God, God created them. Male and female, God created them. The act of creation, of birthing, of incubating, of conceiving is the very first story of God. The God who created gender in the very first place is the God of the scriptures. The act and ability to mother was one of the very first attributes we are given of God. So in youth group last week, um, I have, you know, about half a dozen uh, young ladies this year that tends to be a very female forward youth group. Um, I asked teens to list qualities of God. They did it in rapid fire succession, and the first set were pretty fast. Creative, loving, forgiving, empathetic, discerning, insightful presence. At what point one of them interjected and said, you know, all of this sounds very female. She then went on to say that actually if we were just making the list, it didn't have the header, it would sound like her mom and pointed out that it seems ridiculous that we therefore call God he all the time. Going through the salvation story, God does in fact have the air of a mother. After creation, God remains by humanity's side, defending and correcting, supporting and sustaining, even using God's self as a personal bridge for humanity to the divine. I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty motherly to me. Which by definition is relating to or characteristic of a mother, especially in being caring, protective, and kind. God is actually described in terms of mothering over a dozen times in the Hebrew scriptures. God defines herself as a woman who has birthed God's people. God defines herself as a woman who is still nursing us. And God uses it as a ploy to make the point that God will never abandon or forsake us. In the Psalms, God numerous times gathers us under her wings. We know what right mothering looks like. Because God has set before us the primary image of a mother. Now beyond God, the Bible is full of mothers. From mothers who wait, like Sarah or Elizabeth, to mothers like Jehovah or Hannah, who decide for various reasons to let their child be mothered by another. To Pharaoh's daughter, who sees a child in need, and raises a son not born of her own body. To Mary, who is surprised by a child, and raises a son who is beyond her wildest abilities or dreams. To the widow, who begs the prophet Elijah to save her son from starvation. To today's gospel mother, who is not above humiliating or humbling herself, throwing herself on the ground in front of crowds of people to plead for the life of her daughter. The heart of motherhood, Scripture describes, is a person whose heart lives outside themselves, who are able to see the life and needs of another as more important, maybe even more necessary than their own who is willing to do what it takes to make sure that heart thrives. Now that's demonstrated in a million small sacrifices each day. 
from things like the average mother thinks about going to the bathroom over 20 times before she actually does. <laughs> to creating to-do lists that prioritize kid and family and loved one's needs before they even come to the idea of rest or personal time. To the mental load that we allot to so many mothers that they carry on behalf of their households. From what part of the laundry cycle is the soccer uniform? To what time does ballet end this evening? to how many recitals are happening next weekend and how exactly are we navigating that complicated puzzle. That's my weekend next weekend. It's also demonstrated in hidden love, quiet hope, quiet worries, constant dreams. It is the invisible work of building up and standing by. We read Proverbs 31 this morning, a chunk of it, as, as if it was a psalm this morning. It's written in a similar kind of cadence as a psalm. And traditionally, it's actually sung in the weekly Shabbat service, husband to wife. So in the modern times, many traditions have turned this into a veritable checklist. How to be a good wife and mother. Did you grow a garden today? Check. Did you use your time productively? Check. But it's actually a song to all the hidden labor that, yes, is traditionally done by women and mothers. It's not a to-do list, but an inclusive understanding of all the stuff that happens that doesn't get any praise or recognition. Particularly at the time it was written, it was really served as a weekly thank you note from the men who did receive the credit to the wives who quietly were making it possible. Taking our cue from God and God's example of mothering, we can see the people who mother us in our own lives, the people willing to incubate, create, and let go the people who are able to see in us potential and possibility and are willing to cheerlead the entire way there. The people who let their lives humbly be the stepping stones to our own. The people who bet at the best of times and at the worst of times are just there. Whether it's an ear or whether it's their willingness to jump on a plane to help, or whether it's that they just have the cup of coffee ready and waiting. Mothers in our lives, regardless of biology, are the people who make our lives possible in a million ways that they offer because of love and not credit. They let their hearts walk outside themselves and actively root and encourage us to grow beyond them. So on this Mother's Day, regardless of whatever brunch is happening out there, whatever Hallmark or laser tag is trying to sell you today, let's take a moment and reflect on the sacred side of motherhood. The mothering of our God, the mothering undergirding good discipleship, let us thank God for the examples of mothering as mothering is intended. And let us be inspired to mother one another as God herself has taught us to mother. Amen.